My name is Dave Johnson. I serve as the uh, Chief Assessment Officer at the Federation of State Medical Boards and on the FSMB's behalf, I'd like to thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm delighted to have with us Dr. John Gimple, the President and CEO of the NBOME. And John and I were talking beforehand, and John, it's 2009, so it's, it's a long tenure now that's running for you at the NBOME. Uh, John's also a bit of a road warrior this week. I think this is at least the third or fourth meeting back to back, so uh, I know we were glad to get John in here last night. So John is going to provide us a, an update from the NBOME. I'm sure that we'll touch not only on Comlex, but perhaps even Comfex, I suspect, today. So John, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm going to stand just to keep my lymphatics and uh, uh, musculoskeletal system and everything else moving. Uh, uh, and uh, hopefully to engage you, you're the, the warriors, you're, you're the, the early morning session, so welcome. Thank you for getting up early and uh, being with us to learn a little bit about the National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners, the Comlex USA exam, and uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. As uh, Dave and I were talking about, I started coming to these meetings around 2000 or so when I was uh, uh, on the board of NBOME and then a vice president for NBOME and, you know, a dean and in other kind of roles. Um, and uh, I am an osteopathic family physician myself. I still do practice one half day a week in a residency program, a hospital-based uh, hospital program called Bryn Mawr Hospital just outside of Philadelphia. And uh, so I get to kind of do that as well as my 80-hour work week with the, with the NBOME, like uh, the work week that you all are, are living, uh, especially in, in recent times. But um, uh, I've been involved in uh, medical education as a dean, as a uh, curriculum director, uh, as a re in the residency program world, uh, so kind of uh, come with it with, with that lens. And the role that I play at the NBOME is as president and CEO, uh, working with our staff, working with our board of directors, working with our national faculty uh, to, to uh, uh, deliver on the mission uh, for the national board. Uh, this is the update of some of the, the things that we'll touch on, given the, the time limitations, of course. We'll only hit, hit a couple of highlights and changes, uh, but recognizing that uh, some of you, uh, show of hands, how many of you is your, is your first meeting uh, at the FSMB? Great. And how many of you uh, have never really heard of Comlex or don't know anything about it at all? Oh, a couple of people. Okay, so I'll try to keep that in mind and then please do circle back um, afterwards. So um, I think most importantly, some of the changes related to Comlex we want to highlight. Uh, some of the changes related to the clinical skills testing aspect of Comlex USA, the Level 2 PE exam and the uh, special commission, so we'll highlight that, uh, and of course talk a little bit about other resources for uh, state uh, medical and osteopathic medical licensing boards, including, uh, as Dave mentioned, the Comvex exam, the variable purpose exam, for kind of a relicensure, reentry type purpose that is available to you as well. So the MBOME's mission been around since about well 1934, um, when our organization was founded. Um, is to pr protect the public. Similar to yours, ours role though is in uh, creating the assessments that are used uh, for things like licensure and other, some other roles. Um, we are involved in a portfolio of assessments that are entrusted by the Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine for you know, uh, achievement tests. We have a number of other assessments as you'll see, but the Comlex USA licensure exam is front and center with, with what we do. Um, related healthcare professions, we also do provide exams for about 16 clients, work partnered with them, uh, pediatric dentistry, podiatry, different, different types of groups that we work with to help them to have their assessments for their purposes, um, all, all what the NBOME does. Our, our board, actually Dr. Jerry O'Shea, our immediate past chair is here, and I want to just give a shout out to Dr. O'Shea. You know, she's somewhat emblematic of, of our board members in that she's uh, really dedicated, really smart, really hardworking, but she's in private practice in internal medicine in, in Northern California in a small practice and uh, was the chair of our board during the worst you know, pandemic in 100 years um, and did an incredible job and just handed the gavel over just recently to the gentleman in the middle, Dr. Richard LeBaire, who's actually um, at another professional meeting right now. Um, Dr. LeBaire is a, also a, a family physician. He's a, a a GME Dean uh, at the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine, which was actually, for those of you who know osteopathic medicine, was the first school of osteopathic medicine founded about 126 years ago. Um, and uh, that's uh, Dr. LeBaire. And uh, the other uh, gentlemen and ladies up here are the, the officers 
Uh, this gives you some smattering, too, of the governance of, of our organization. Again, as a nonprofit organization, uh, all, all of our board members are uh, uh, osteopathic physicians uh, or public members, and we have two public members on our board. Um, uh, they come from all around, as you would imagine, geographically, different specialties, uh, different uh, you know, uh, uh, genders and other uh, elements of diversity, even, even the, age, the age group. And the joke we were saying earlier is like when you, you, know, you ever look around the room and realize you were the oldest one in the room, um, and uh, you know, what do you define young as, right? Is young you know, less than 60 now, Maureen? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get a 30-something and 40-something involved in something that involves all the dedicated volunteer time like the time that you all put in, um, but we work real hard um, to, to do that. And by the way, from the licensure community, um, uh, quite a number of representatives here. I'd say three or four of these have either served or are currently serving on a state medical or osteopathic medical licensing board. Um, really tremendous um, uh, you know, uh, role that, that that brings to the rest of our uh, board. But the, the other roles, many of them are in graduate medical education and teaching hospitals or uh, UME. Uh, or private practice and practicing docs who make up a, a big portion of our national faculty as well as our board as well. So Comlex USA, the licensure exam, front and center, that's what we're going to give you updates on. We'll mention a few others. Um, uh, Comvex, uh, I'll just mention this one word here, the Catalyst platform. Catalyst is not an exam, but it's a longitudinal assessment platform that we're now in year six or seven with. Uh, using that platform to put content into so that uh, doctors or learners or whoever can, uh, can learn from assessment. They take a uh, look at a test question on their phone or iPad, they answer the question, they get the, qu the answer right away, they get the rationale for why it was correct, they get learning resources for how to learn more about the topic. And we use that platform for a number of formative assessments and we actually partnered with the American Osteopathic Association in recent years for 16 different specialties. Uh, for the purposes of what we used to call recertification or maintenance of certification or osteopathic continuous certification, whatever you want to call it, doctors continuing to try to demonstrate that they're fit for practice by take, taking test questions, getting feedback, uh, and continuing to improve. Um, so that's our Catalyst platform. But we'll, we'll talk mostly about Comlex uh, here today. And uh, one question that we hear, you know, sometimes and it recircles every once in a while is, Okay, well, we understand, you know, you're osteopathic physicians, you have a little bit of a distinctive role within the overall house of medicine, but why do you have your own licensure assessment and what have you? We hear that, I've heard that question, um, and it recircles, it recirculates every once in a while. And of course, uh, you know, the, the answer is actually really quite simple. Um, it, we have a distinctive philosophy that uh, osteopathic physicians do that, that is somewhat distinctive in that the approach to patients is an interconnected body, mind, spirit approach to partnering with patients to find, maintain, and restore health. And when we study the practice of osteopathic medicine, there's differences and similarities with uh, our colleagues who are MDs. And in fact, those play out and can be shown in our research uh, that are distinctive. For example, the percentage of patient presentations that present to DOs. So we build an exam that's designed for the competencies and the practice for osteopathic medicine, and an exam that looks back at the curricular program leading to the DO degree and aligns um, there as well. So just a short little 60 second video clip that kind of describes that, and I'll ask you to run that now. When patients seek care from an osteopathic physician, they have a right to expect that this DO has qualified by virtue of graduating from an AOA COCA accredited DO school, having passed standards for entry into the profession that they're about to enter. The extent to which the content of an assessment matches a curricular program is important and quite relevant. Perhaps even more essential is the alignment with the competencies required for the practice of osteopathic medicine. So tacking on an OMT or OPP test onto a separate licensing exam would not be an equivalently defensible approach to assessing competencies. In other words, a DO having passed a national standardized assessment designed for the practice of osteopathic medicine and aligned with the curricular program for a DO school is in the best interest of the public and the patients. So it's a great opportunity to thank the Federation of State Medical Boards for inviting us to give this update um, and for their support. They've had longstanding support uh, recognizing the importance of Comlex USA to state licensing boards and helping to protect the public in your communities and your jurisdictions to say, yes, this is a DO. They have DO after their name. They have demonstrated competencies for practice as a DO. 
um, in, in your jurisdiction. So uh, just a little bit uh, on that. Uh, the American Medical Association, likewise, uh, has official policy supporting kind of parity of the use of COMLEX for other secondary uses as well, and something that we may want to talk about in the question and answer session if, if I wasn't clear uh, on that topic. So as a reminder, COMLEX is a licensure exam accepted by all of you, all of the licensing jurisdictions in the United States, actually a couple others uh, around the globe, Australia, the Medical uh, Council of uh, Medical Board of Australia, uh, based on a recommendation from the Australian Medical Council a couple of years ago, uh, gave, recognized COMLEX and MBOME for a competent uh, 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 pathway authority for licensure, you know, registration, they call it, in, uh, in Australia for a DO with two years of ACGME or AOA training uh, in the States, uh, and then uh, the COMLEX credential, so um, pretty exciting. Um, and uh, something you may not know um, is that the COMLEX USA uh, program, level one, level two, uh, are required for the DO degree as well. The osteopathic medical schools in the United States are accredited by the AOA's Commission on Osteopathic College Accreditation. That's de they're deemed that authority by the U.S. Department of Education as the recognized authority for accrediting osteopathic medical schools, of which there are now about 38 operating at about 60 campus locations around the United States. It's been a tremendous uh, amount of growth. And uh, the, every DO student, in order to walk across that stage, which is happening about this time of year, right, uh, graduation time, May and June, um, is, uh, uh, needs to have demonstrated that to, to a national standard, their competencies for the practice of osteopathic medicine. Um, so the exam program itself is a little complicated. They, they, the, the old joke is, well, we may call it complex, but it is kind of complex, right? Um, three examinations, three levels, and then below the, the, the meridian here, the, we have the level two PE, the clinical skills exam, which was indefinitely suspended uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and much more on that. The three levels uh, are typically taken, level one, around the end of the second year of osteopathic medical school, kind of going into transitioning into doing clerkships, core clerkships, uh, 352 question multiple choice test delivered at, uh, currently at um, Prometric uh, test centers around the 300 or so centers around the, the U.S. Um, level two CE, uh, typically taken then after that third year, that clerkship year, maybe early in the fourth year. Um, another uh, pretty rigorous multiple choice exam with the uh, different uh, elements of the blueprint, as you'll see in a minute. And then uh, the level three is the one that residents take, typically after about one year of residency. And that's the one that once they finish, they have essentially the COMLEX credential. They bring that transcript to you all, uh, whether you require one year, two years, or three years of GME and whatever else you require, they bring that all to you and then uh, apply for a license. Um, again, level two PE used to also uh, be required, of course, for graduation and uh, fall in there, but um, that one has been suspended now since March of 2020 when the pandemic first started. Uh, we shut that exam down and continued to study it and work with it, uh, but really could not bring it back given the ongoing nature of the pandemic. Um, and as you'll hear, the short-term solution as we were figuring things out was that we used our attestation program where the deans already attest that a candidate is in good academic and professional standing, for example, to take our level one. We build from that system to have the deans and the college's faculty attest that the candidate has demonstrated their fundamental osteopathic clinical skills for graduation. Um, more on that in, in just a little bit. Test blueprint and all that information, I'm sure you're interested in that. That's all on our website. We, frame, we sample the content of the universe, if you will, uh, based on competency domains. You guessed it, the competency domains for osteopathic medical practice and clinical presentations. So as an example, when I mentioned earlier the evidence-based design, we study what osteopathic physicians see and do in practice from national ambulatory and other you know, uh, sources, uh, do other you know, job task analyses like uh, procedures and such to, to determine uh, how to modify blue, uh, the, the blueprint uh, percentages, in other words, how to sample the content to make sure that at the end of the day, the candidate has demonstrated their minimal competency to be trusted for the practice of osteopathic medicine uh, when they come to you. So you can check that all out on our, uh, on our website. Some big changes, though, in COMLEX. Uh, and uh, uh, one of them is we did make the transition this year 
Uh, in fact, just this month, which is our new test cycle starts, the or start of May, I should say, um, uh, to um, a uh, pass and fail only uh, score reporting. So there's no numerical data coming out of there. There's no standard score of 550 or 700, these scores that you've been used to dealing with, for just level one alone. So the other, uh, level two and level three, still do have numerical scores. And that change was made predominantly based on a really about a 10-year evaluation and then a very intense evaluation and in uh, partnership as well with uh, talking with uh, uh, other authorities across the House of Medicine uh, and student groups and others who really weighed in on this that the, the downside of getting that numerical score uh, because of the stress that that seemed to be creating in the environment when those scores were being uh, misused or overused for secondary purposes other than which they were created, was creating such a, uh, a, a, a an un unwell situation. Students were disengaging from their curricular program in order to study to get a better score on a licensing exam as a second year student. They were not getting involved in co-curricular activities because of that. They were reporting an inordinate amount of stress and uh, uh, anxiety and other types of things. And um, so it really just seemed like the best, the best thing to do. Our colleagues at the US MLE exam were planning to do the same with their step one, which is somewhat analogous in terms of in where in time it happens. And they're used often interchangeably by residency program directors to determine, OK, I have you know, 1,000 applicants. I can only interview 100. How can I whittle them down a bit? Um, so uh, it, it seemed like the right timing and the right thing to do. We gave the, the community ample notice, a couple of years, to kind of uh, bring that on in, and uh, happening with the current second year students who are, I spoke with a bunch of them this week at meetings, they're getting ready to take their level one. Uh, for the first time, it will be only report that you passed. Um, hopefully, <laughs> right? Uh, the other big change is that we, um, uh, we have uh, uh, shrunk the number of times you can take any COMLEX exam uh, down to four starting this year as well. Um, it used to be there were six maximum attempts for any level within the COMLEX. Um, and I know many of you at your states have three you know, you can only take three each level three times or two times in one case, I think, and uh, what have you. But uh, ours in general, most of the colleges of osteopathic medicine as well have a three, uh, something around a three limit for any exam. So this might not really have a huge impact, but uh, potentially a minus some. So pass-fail happens on May. If, if a candidate took the level one exam prior to May of this year, they will still have a score, and that score, that numerical score, will still remain on the transcript. And we'll also still go through the residency application, the ERAS, if they apply to residencies and that kind of thing. Um, however, um, if they take the level one starting this May, it will just say pass on the date they pass the exam or you know, fail the date and then pass the date. That's all that we'll go through um, uh, on either the residency transcript or the transcript that comes to you all. Um, that's the only information you'll have. Now, uh, the score report is basically yada, 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 pass, yada, 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 pass. I mean, that's what they get. They pass. You know? um, it might be a couple of years from now they'll be saying, I really want more. But actually, we, they do get more. Actually, in Comlex Level 1, they will get a second page. This is not really the score report. It's called the, sorry, it's so small, the uh, performance, a formative performance profile. Uh, you won't get this on the transcript, you as the licensing community. Uh, residency program directors will never see this. This is only for the candidate herself or himself and the school, the coach, the mentor, the people at the school working. It's for the purposes of continuous quality improvement and lifelong learning. And it has a couple of big black box warnings. I love this one. Do not share. See that one? That, that actually, that's not for you, do not share. This is public, this is on our website. But it will actually say do not share, watermarked right on. And then it has this black box warning, which I don't know if you have a good sense of humor, but I'll, I'll go there just in case. Um, it basically says, if you share this with anyone, you will be considered a gunner trying to outcompete every other resident for every other applicant for a residency program. Uh, it doesn't really say that. It basically says, you know, we st MBOMI strongly cautions against the use of this information for any other purposes. It's formative, it's developmental, it's to, it's to help foster a growth mindset so that the learner can say, hey, I passed the exam, hooray, but, you know, I was lower than average in some areas. Maybe those are areas that I should work on to continue to try to be better. Right? And I was strong in these areas. Maybe I keep, want to kind of keep going and doing what I'm doing uh, in that way. So it, of course, gives information about the blueprint. And this is on our website, so you can check that out. The other big news in the Comlex USA world is we're transitioning our delivery uh, partner 
um, to from uh, Prometric, where we've been for 20 years, just about, to um, a Pearson View. And Pearson View has a larger number of centers uh, that are of interest to where our candidates are. They really are the global leader uh, in uh, this test delivery type area and what have you. We're thrilled with their ability to innovate with us, and that all happens in 2023, starting with level three uh, in January of 2023. So more on that uh, on our website as well. Um, we have colleges of osteopathic medicine at about 60 different locations now, and um, those locations are, you know, in, in all over the place, some of them in, uh, you know, more remote, remote areas and what have you, and uh, Pearson View has really worked with us to make sure that we have test centers that are in good proximity for the candidates uh, in those areas uh, in particular. So to just take a quick break from Comlex uh, to Comvex. Comvex is really only available to state medical and osteopathic medical licensing boards. If you have a reentry candidate or a, a, a doctor who, a DO who for some reason you want to assess their overall ability to apply osteopathic medical knowledge, maybe they've been out of practice for five years or there's been another reason that you want to check, the Comvex is available to you. I won't spend much time talking about Comvex, but again, there's information on our website. It's available to you. There's a, a couple of you all that use it pretty regularly for doctors in this situation, and I think some of your boards have really never used it. It's there as a resource. It's, uh, we do invest in keeping it updated, uh, resetting uh, standards, um, and we, in fact, re-enhanced the blueprint and really revised the blueprint to align more with the, com the newer Comlex framework where we have competency domains, exactly the same as in Comlex, and clinical presentations, and we refined some of that just recently. Uh, so um, that, that, um, that service is available to you, and you, you as the licensing authority would get the score report back, and then you determine you know, uh, passing and okay, that's, uh, we give you information to help interpret that uh, and uh, uh, you use it in the way that you decide to use it in determining whether to, you know, grant that person uh, their license or continue their license. So back to Comlex USA, this wicked problem that we all had and looking around the country internationally, we worked with our colleagues in the States, we worked with our colleagues uh, in uh, Canada, Dr. Topps, we worked with our colleagues all around the world in terms of how can we give a hands-on, in-the-room exam, where examinees travel oftentimes very far to get to the test center as well, and then have a very interactive hands-on experience with standardized patients in the middle of a pandemic. And the conclusion is we could not do it in the middle of the pandemic, at least the acute phase of the pandemic. Um, and there was massive amount of uh, environmental uh, concern, uproar, lots of different stakeholders. Um, it was not a pretty time there. Um, you know, and, and you all were in that same world, and it wasn't a pretty time for you all trying to, how do you deal with granting licenses, right, to, um, to candidates? How do you deal with all the other stuff? Plus, everybody, as it continues to happen, dealing with everything that's going on at home, in our own communities, the social and political unrest that was going on at the same time. It was really uh, a wild couple of years. Um, we decided, rather than make a, a permanent decision on where we were going with clinical skills, that this was a wicked problem and it was a really important problem for the profession to solve. The osteopathic medical profession needed to get together and come together on where we were going to go with the component of clinical skills assessment that uh, was in the licensure exam series. So we brought together representatives from uh, really across uh, our entire profession, including learners. There were 20 members on the commission. The, the commission is still in existence, but there were 20 members. Three of them were students or residents. A lot of educators from both a graduate medical education and undergraduate, accreditors, uh, groups like uh, COCA, and I mentioned earlier at ACGME and the GME side. The licensure arena, thank you, we had four or five people of the 20 who had licensure experience. Dr. Barbara Walker, there's a good example. Dr. Michael Whiting. Uh, just to name a couple who are in this room, uh, from the AAOE and uh, those affiliated with the FSMB. So we made sure we had the licensure lens and that group there. Of course, the deans of the colleges, which are undergraduate educators, and public members as well, always important uh, to our board and, and to other things that we do, to come together and say, what do we do about this situation? What might be some solutions? So we uh, put out a call for uh, position statements and individual feedback uh, over a year ago and got lots of information, Ran you know, ranging from we don't need national clinical skills exams because it's done at the schools, that was a common type theme, to um, this is critically important, C 
critically important. These are the fundamental competencies. And yeah, you can't do it in the middle of a pandemic, come up with interim solutions. But once we get past the acute phase, maybe get beyond this pandemic someday, we can uh, look at how that might be best done. And um, the first thing we had to do was to make sure that there were pathways that the current learners caught in the midst of all this could continue to move on. People had to make sure they could continue to get their learning and development, right? And then we had to make sure we could continue to have them move on and be able to uh, take, you know, graduate, take their level three and come to you to get a license, but with some assurance that they're being assessed. And that we call the uh, attestation, where we ask deans and uh, trusted agents there at the schools to say, all right, it's a pandemic, you know, rules are, are a little different. Um, make sure that each student undergoes some type of assessment of these fundamental clinical skills and then let us know that you did that so that we can kind of put that into their portfolio, if you will, and let them proceed on. Um, we also did a, a uh, survey of, of, the school, of the schools, pretty de very detailed inventory where they told us all the ways that they do that. How do they assess it? Is it a capstone exam? How reliable is it to use criterion reference standard setting? You know, all, what rigor is associated with it, et cetera? Um, and then uh, really learned a number of things and then actually just a couple of weeks ago put out some uh, preliminary recommendations to the public. Maybe you saw them for your feedback and everybody else's feedback. We're getting lots. And first of all, um, it seems to be an emerging, and I'm not even on the special commission, I'm kind of like an observer and helper, so uh, uh, I'm just, uh, just the messenger here, but basically learned that um, clinical skills is really important, an assessment of those is critically important to being a good osteopathic physician, and we feel this is really important where our patients rely on us to do this, so it, it needs to in, in some way continue. But perhaps rather than the model where uh, all of our students were traveling from around the country to one of two national centers, we can go back to the model which actually we had envisioned in the 1990s when this exam came on to say maybe we could deliver it at some of the schools who in the last 20 years, no surprise, have invested a lot in facilities and infrastructure and standardized patients and faculty development to be able to assess these things. So um, they could have a role and that could be it. And then, but it is important to have some national standard. Without that, there's not an independent audit uh, type function, kind of the, the failure to fail related mentality of you know, um, you know, the coaches and the teachers and whatever at the school, if they're the ones making the decision, you know, we, we certainly trust them and whatever, but you know, there's bias involved and we need some type of a valid, reliable, independent audit. We believe our patients and the public rely on us for that. We believe our profession uh, you know, it, it would be important to do that. So those were some kind of key takeaways that frame those um, recommendations. We created short-term pathways, as mentioned, to allow learners to continue to move on and be able to come to you and all, most of you, all of you, in fact, recently in Pennsylvania, I know there was a decision made too to say, yeah, we're gonna accept that, you know, in the interim time in, in terms of meeting the requirement that, we, that clinical skills have been assessed. Um, but here's those recommendations, and I won't review all of them. I'll just let you know that there were four major themes to the recommendations. The first one on clinical skills is very high level, but out for feedback is it, that establish a COM, that's College of Osteopathic Medicine based, COM like a national standardized assessment, which includes an in-person, hands-on. We're osteopathic physicians, in case you don't know. We touch patients, like we do physical exam maneuvers that involve putting our hands on. We do other maneuvers that can help treat certain situations by putting our hands on. Kind of have to assess those. Patient safety, right? If you're gonna be doing that to patients and learning, you wanna know that people have assessed that they can do that in a safe way, for example. And then notice some of the other words here. It must include kind of this interpersonal and communication skills piece. Not negotiable, in our view, in terms of communicating with a, with a patient, a uh, family member, et cetera, is so critical to safe and effective care, right? Well, I don't need to tell licensing board people that because many of the doctors who get in trouble with you all who come to you for disciplinary issues, right? Communication, one of those big issues. And also OMT, osteopathic manipulative treatment, needs to be assessed in that way and with quality assurance. So it's quite high level, but we have put that out. And if you have information or ideas about meaningful implementation uh, ways. We have a number of them ourselves, but we wanted to get community involvement and feedback. Once the special commission gets this information, they're gonna process it relative to their recommendations, take it to our board of directors, and we actually expect to have a decision by July of this year for the classes of uh, 2024 and beyond. The classes of 2023, that up, up till then, they know that they have the, the route for using attestation uh, to do there. Second theme, diversity, equity, and inclusion. What an opportunity. 
uh, to be able to make sure that if there are systemic biases that are, uh, or disadvantages that are furthered by things related to testing and assessment, that we ameliorate those, we remove those, we pay attention to those. And a number of things there that I think are great opportunities for continuous uh, improvement. Um, continuing to take advantage of emerging technologies and also new content, new test content not to mention coronavirus 19 and its related stuff. If we can ever figure, out, figure it out, what, what is stable information that you can actually test uh, with this crazy virus and all of its cousins. Um, but that, that really, frankly, all, already happens. There, we have continuous blueprint review and every two years it's updates, so um, it's great. And then the last area is technology. How about test delivery and also technology? And you heard about the Pearson View announcement. So um, maybe someday there could be test delivery and enhancements that are secure enough reliable enough that bricks and mortar testing centers are no longer necessary. Right now we're still a bit concerned, you know, around the world. Uh, others have had some experience with this. We're continuing to pilot that with our COMAT exams and others, so um, that's that. So uh, we're actually requesting feedback by May 4th. Um, they've been out for about three weeks or so. Um, final recommendations to our board and that's it. So we, we do want to hear from you on these recommendations. We have met with many of you and we are available to come and meet with your state uh, medical or osteopathic medical licensing board if you just let uh, Dr. Uh, Doug Murray who's in the room here, uh, Dr. O'Shea, Dr. Schaefer, myself, um, we'll be happy to set up a visit, a Zoom visit or whatever to your group um, and walk you through whatever information you'd need uh, or you would like about uh, the exam and then look for, the, look for those recommendations coming out in, um, uh, in July. Next little section is just about uh, on uh, co uh, the continuous research agenda that the MBOME uh, has. You know, a lot of it does uh, relate to examination validity, predictive validity. Some of it uh, you know, pertains to obviously new innovations and obviously with the clinical skills realm, there's lots going on uh, in, that, in that realm. Uh, a lot of that also involves publishing lots of manuscripts and uh, advocacy uh, around the globe, but also in the United States for uh, osteopathic medical practice, qualifications that DOs have, um, you know, being somewhat of a minority within the overall big house of medicine in the United States, you can imagine that sometimes there are, you know, different situations that might be inadvertently, you know, discriminatory. Oh, well, what is a DO? I don't know. Is that, you know, and so, you know, as a DO, if you're not a DO, it, I'll, I'll let you know what it's like. It's great. But you do explain yourself a lot in terms of what, what is, what's distinctive, what, what do you do, how, are you a real doctor? Yeah, we are really, can you be licensed? Yeah, you can do surgery? Yeah, we can really, do. you can prescribe medicine? Yeah, we can, but we're careful about it because we, we practice this body, mind, spirit type approach. You, you know most of the rest. But we do a lot of that in a lot of national meetings and whatever. And we've had to do a lot of that in the residency program director community in the last few years because as you know, there's one single accreditor of all the GME, and that's ACGME. Um, the Amer uh, Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education in the United States. So we've been working a lot with different specialties. And in some specialties, they, they understand, oh yeah, DOs, great, we want, we want DOs in our program. They're going to really diversify the education in the milieu and this is going to be a great learning environment. And in some specialties, it's kind of like, oh, I don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't really interview DOs or we don't really want them in our program. Um, Hey, the world continues to evolve, right? We all learn more and more diversity, equity, inclusion, inclusion of different pathways, learning about each other. It's most of it all really well-intentioned, um, but you know, those, some of those hidden biases sometimes occur, and um, you know, we're uh, uh, often called to kind of you know, point those out or have discussions about those and learn from each other, and we do that with lots of uh, grassroots efforts and what have you. There was an initiative, and I don't know if it was presented on in this meeting uh, this week, called the uh, Coalition for Physi Physician Accountability's UME to GME Review Committee. Um, it was about a 13-month project by 30 individuals chosen from about 280 nominees from across the House of Medicine, all the alphabet soup organizations, including uh, FSMB and uh, uh, the uh, MBOME, whatever, had, had chance to kind of weigh in in the development of this. And the group spent about 200 hours on Zoom during the pandemic and coming up with recommendations to try to improve all the stressors that are happening in the current transition to GME. Whether you're a USDO student or a US um, MD student or a, an international graduate trying to transition into the US GME system, it's very complicated. And there's lots of extra costs and extra stressors and lots of mistrust and you know, the, the advising resources, what, what, how, what, how are you going to get an interview, what are the, 
they're often not trustworthy, not inclusive, not whatever. So this group actually worked together to come up with 34 recommendations. Of course, they released it in August last year, still in the middle of the pandemic. And in today's society, nobody seems to be able to read anything more than 245 characters, you know, a tweet. So uh, it was 26 pages, and that was a lot to read, apparently, because a lot of people just said, oh, I don't like those, and didn't really read them. And if you actually read them, they were all about inclusion, diversity, equity and inclusion, bias, reducing that for health equity uh, that actually connects to health disparities as well. Um, wellness, reducing costs for learners who are spending a lot of money for a lot of different things in the system. Um, and specific to the, 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 the notion I mentioned earlier, um, if it's a DO, if it, no matter who the candidate is, whether it might be a Canadian medical graduate, might be a, uh, you know, from a, a, a graduate, a, an MD or MBBS from India, might be a US DO student, might be a US MD student, holistic review is what all of us seem to agree is the best thing moving forward. Holistic review, what are the unique attributes that that candidate brings? And let's evaluate that candidate, that residency applicant I'm talking about, based on a holistic review. So if it's a DO, you should be using Comlex. That's the licensure exam and the exam that the osteopathic world uses, the accreditor uses, et cetera. If it's an MD in the US, it should be the US MLE exam, uh, just to give you the examples. And actually, um, one of the recommendations specifically pertain to that. If you're interested in that, please check out the physician, uh, the Coalition for Physician Accountability's website, and you can uh, read through those recommendations. The coalition in the United States, by the way, has no authority to implement any of these recommendations. But they are all of the organizations that kind of do. So if all the organizations got together and said, hey, we really like number one, we don't like number two, it could happen. I can tell you that hasn't happened. Nobody has taken on one of the, the downsides of, the, uh, of that is that there is no real accountability uh, or authority to do that. But I'll tell you, I, I wrote a, an article that's going to be published next month in the Journal of Osteopathic Medicine about the pros and cons, limitations, but also the opportunities of these um, recommendations, having been one of those survivors of 200 Zoom hours uh, on, as a member of this, uh, this particular group. So lots of publishing. Uh, our website has all of this linked. So if you want to read what's the evidence for predictive validity of COMLEX, what's the evidence for the, what about the COMSE exam, what about COMAT, what about that catalyst, what about COMVEX, the exam program I mentioned earlier, you can go and check it out. These were all in the last, what, two, three years. And the most recent peer-reviewed publications um, are listed here, one of them looking at score concordance of different exams, uh, looking at our different COMAT and COMSE. Um, our, our staff is just amazing in terms of the amount of effort that they put into it. And, and a lot of it is very collaborative research. I'll point out one particular manuscript we were very proud of that we partnered with the FSMB, and we thank uh, the FSMB for that, uh, that was looking at a predictive validity of COMLEX and a correlating performance in the COMLEX exam with disciplinary uh, action at the state licensing board level. And lo and behold, uh, correlations associations did exist that, you know, failures and low scores in our exams did in some way predict doctors who were going to get in trouble with you all, whatever that means, you can look into that and uh, 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 go from there. The score concordance study was an interesting one for those program directors who want to use exams in holistic ways in looking at a DO applicants coming into the program, a concordance tool, we also have a percentile conversion tool, might be helpful. And if you're interested more in the topic, maybe you're new to what are these DOs, I still don't know. Um, there's information, some editorials about the distinctive practice of osteopathic medicine and also some myths and uh, misconceptions that are commonly out there that are all available on the MBOMES website. We hope that you'll uh, visit and check it out. And maybe you're so excited by all of this, and probably, right? that you would like to be part of MBOME's national faculty. How many of you are part of MBOME's national faculty? Do we have a raise of hands? Look, yeah, we have, we have a great number of folks from the licensure community, but we're always looking for new folks, people with diverse perspectives and experiences. And you don't have to be a DO, by the way. We have lots of MDs, we have PhDs, we have JDs and other people with subject matter expertise. We need that expertise. It's actually almost 800 credentialed individuals. We're so proud of this group from all over the country, and in fact, a couple international folks as well. Um, and uh, they help write content. And you might say, I don't have any experience writing test questions. I'm an internist or I'm a whatever. Well, we can teach you with that. We bring folks in. We, we do training. We have online training. Uh, maybe you'd like to be on standard setting panels. We have a standard setting panel coming up for our level 2C, I think, this year. We're actively looking for nominations now. We assure that standard setting panels have very adequate representation from the licensure community because the perspective you bring 
on minimal competency and protect the public is really important um, to things like setting of a passing standard for a national licensure exam. So um, please do um, let us know. You can, uh, by the way, get on our website. There's a national faculty tab. It drops down and it says um, national faculty, apply to the national faculty, you send your CV in, the chair of the department uh, reviews it, make sure you are who you say you are, you're a licensed you know, physician or whatever, you're this, you're that, and, uh, and then we find new roles to be able to play. So always looking for surgeons and OBGYNs. I don't know if you guys, for some reason, especially in the osteopathic world, I always joke that osteopathic surgeons like to do surgery. <laughs> I'm not sitting on some committee. I'm not going to write test questions, right, Maureen? I don't know if you have problems up in, in Canada with that, but certain specialties, it seems like, uh, harder to, uh, to do. So that's kind of the, the big high-level update on Comlex, Convex, MBOME, a little bit about osteopathic medicine um, you know, flared in. We wanted to try to leave questions. I actually left my watch over there, but leave some time for questions if uh, we have that. And uh, um, are we able to do that? Where are we? I think, uh, we've got about 15 minutes oh, total wonderful. before 8 o'clock, but okay. I think we have about time. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. minutes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, go right ahead. I think Dr. Gipple is ready to answer your questions. Uh, there's no microphone, it's, so we'll it'll, just have to listen. It's pretty good. Oh. Uh, Razak from uh, uh, State of Missouri. Um, question Do you cross reference uh, your questionnaire data? based with USMLE or do you have uh, your own total or is there any cross-reference? Plus, what percentage of your questions come in from just osteopathic evaluation? A oh, great, great question. So uh, if you didn't hear the question, do, uh, is there shared data banks between other licensing exams like USMLE, which the MD uh, students take? No, we, we have, we're independent organizations. We're very collaborative. We, um, we meet frequently and talk about lots of issues of common interest and best practices, but we maintain our own databases, our own national faculties, uh, that type of thing. And the second piece of it was, I forget the, I think it was, uh, what percentage? oh, what percentage related to that stuff? So that's a really good question. If you, if you look at the blueprint uh, information, it's not like the, the OMT or OPP is a separate kind of tack on type of element to Comlex. It's baked into the cake in that, the entire exam is designed to align with the practice of osteopathic medicine. The competencies required, which do include you know, some of the manual diagnostic and manual treatment techniques, but also some of the osteopathic principles and some of the other uh, elements that have always been essential to osteopathic medicine, which are actually are becoming more and more essential to, as everybody realizes, to just good care, social determinants of health, uh, public health and uh, health promotion. Um, just to give you a couple of examples. So uh, all of those are, are considered, if you, if you, I, I showed it quickly and it was a small, uh, a small view there, but the competency domains for osteopathic medicine are actually seven domains. And in each of the seven domains, there's osteopathic principles woven throughout, but there is also a separate domain that is uh, osteopathic. What, um, uh, what people jump to the conclusion sometimes is, oh, well, a DO is essentially an MD with an extra tool in the toolbox. They can do OMT. And um, that's a convenient elevator speech that many DOs even use and whatever to describe that. But uh, actually, um, osteopathic medicine from its founding was, was set out to try to actually change healthcare. And I know, you know, uh, change can be threatening. Oh, why do we have to change? You know, the only human that likes change is a baby with a wet diaper, right? Uh, but it was somewhat of, of a really uh, evolutionary concept that has continued to evolve over 130 years. So the assessment is actually integ integrating all of that OPP and OMT throughout the entire assessment, not just a section that is OMT, OPP. Great. At the back. How about the far back? Let's start there. Yeah, it, it gets to this, doctor, it gets to the concern about, you know, I think this is your concern is, will, will um, pa is pass fail lowering the bar? It, will students study less hard? Will they prepare less hard? Will they not take it as serious? It's similar, right, question? 
And, um, I, you know, I think uh, that would be a very unintended consequence to this change and, and certainly needs to be studied. Um, but uh, I, the, the bar has not changed. Uh, in fact, for, for us, uh, level one of Comlex, our bar pass fail for level one is still where it is, and it will be reevaluated every three to five years as it always is. And uh, historically, sometimes it gets raised because people they keep this, you know, the, 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 the bar just seems to, you know, continue to change for, uh, for us. I think in the US MLE world, I think they did reset a passing standard for step one this year. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. as well. So, so it's, not like any, it's not like there's any reducing of the standards. Will students, you know, prepare less? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think that we will have to, we will have to see. I, I know that uh, we've always encouraged students, and we speak with students a lot, to fully engage in their curricular program. And their curricular program is designed to help them, not just the formal curriculum, but the co-curricular program. I was giving the anecdote earlier, I remember as a student, hundred years ago, um, you know, when there was a visiting lecture from a prestigious, you know, faculty member, which was frequently, um, I went to school in Philadelphia, um, on campus giving a 7 p.m. lecture that night, but you had an anatomy test the next day, which did you go to? Um, I usually tried to go to that visiting lecture because it might be the one chance right. I can get to, you know, uh, learn uh, these pearls and then, you know, stay up most of the night and study the anatomy. But um, so to the extent that it will engage students into some other things, which is important to their development as a physician, community involvement, other type of activities and what have you, and still balance. I mean, I don't know how many of you still work with our students and whatever, but our students are just amazing. The MD students, the DO students, I work with both of them every week, uh, are so committed, are so amazing individuals, really smart. <laughs> Really, uh, the, the, the experience they come into medical school with uh, is amazing. Um, and they're gonna do fine with lots of the, the content and that kind of thing, I think, in the pass-fail environment. And most importantly, let's remember, what are we trying to do in medical school, whether it's DO or MD? Yeah, we're trying to train competent physicians, right? This is just John speaking, not MBO me, but, um, but we're also trying to make sure that they come out on the other end, compassionate, empathetic individuals that will sit in a room or whatever with the patient and be there for that patient. Be empathetic, be caring. Um, if they go through something that has actually been likened to a disease from which they have to recover, which was the current environment of having to prep for six to eight weeks, 20 hours a day, taking all kinds of expensive test prep things and whatever, just to pass a minimal competency licensure exam, which is being overused by residency program directors to determine who to rank because they have too many applicants and not enough time to review it was just a, a negative consequence of the current environment. So um, nobody knows for sure, doctor, whether this is the best move, but I think it, was, uh, it, it is a, um, an important move to try to recognize that um, we want smart doctors, competent doctors, skilled doctors, but also physicians who um, can be empathetic and caring and good human beings uh, and have really sustained, healthy, happy careers for hopefully 30, 40 years and take care of all of us. Um, so. Heidi King at Kentucky. Um, give me the wisdom. How do I holistically assess a student in a 20 minute Zoom interview? I've got Dr. Whiting's letter. I can call him, but that takes a lot of time. I interview for anesthesiology and neurosurgery and I don't want to match someone into a residency that's not a good fit. Many students have very little experience in those disciplines unless they really already know and seek it out. I'm an advisory dean too and on the first day of medical school I make them, what are you going to be when you grow up? Write it down, four years later I hand it to them and I'm like, I think you'll be happy with your new decision or I think you'll be happy with where you've always wanted to go. So how do we cut through the weeds? Part of it is, can I spend eight to 20 hours with this person? Do they belong to my tribe? And how do we figure that out in 20 minutes? Well, Dr. Koenig, thank you for your question. I think it directly pertains to the, uh, the current situation of the chaos that I was talking about with the UME to GME review committee, you know, uh, the transition. 
lots and lo lots of applicants from lots of different schools and, and other countries applying for, you know, luckily an, an increasing number of spots, but, um, but with the, in the COVID world, we had to transition, we, all of us, you know, the, the, the US uh, GME world to virtual interviews. There were many people from the beginning, uh, I'll say, in the, both the UME GME review committee as well as across the House of Medicine that I've interacted with that said, this is great. Virtual interviews, Zoom interviews help us to do it quickly, more efficiently. By the way, save a lot of cost and expense for, for the candidates, which is perhaps the biggest pro for virtual interviews. Um, but many, many cons, and I can tell you that probably one of the loudest mouth cons on the UME GME review committee and whatever we're coming from uh, a couple of us, and I was one of them, saying, uh, not so fast. Uh, we have to do it in COVID, of course. Great, great. The people have to interview. We've got to have residents and whatever. But once we get beyond COVID and whatever, could we at least, can we look at the data? Let's show us the data because where's the data that shows that this system of virtual interviews, albeit more efficient, more cost effective, and whatever, is actually going to create better matches? In other words, student doctors who are then going to become doctors who are happy, successful, and in a learning environment that they found good. So I, I am still very skeptical about that, but I can tell you that there are, there are very big proponents for going all virtual all the time forever and not, never going back. Um, the UME GME Review Committee did not recommend going to all virtual forever and whatever, although that's what some people think because they haven't read them. Um, it said study the issue. Let's study it and look at the data and come up with recommendations. Um, it might be that there's some hybrid that moves forward. Uh, I can tell you that there's now some data coming out from the ENT preference signaling pilot, if you're familiar with that, and a couple other innovations that are showing that um, things like away and audition rotations. You mentioned that, give me eight or 10 hours or a couple of weeks of working with someone, and then I can say, hey, she's gonna really be successful in our environment, and as importantly, she's gonna be really happy and thrive in this environment. So um, as that data starts to come out over the next actually several months in this year, um, hopefully the whole house of medicine can make some um, rational and more permanent decisions and not jump to the conclusion that, you know, it was kind of convenient and saved me some time and saved some people money. And maybe that's good for diversity, equity, and inclusion as well. People from lower socioeconomic groups and whatever, especially hit harder by the costs. Good, good point there. But uh, hopefully that answers your question. We we might want to be mindful of time. We're at about yeah. five till the hour. The next plenary session it starts One in five minutes. A so very quick, quick comment. Time. I don't want to hug the microphone, but the fellowship programs. We've had a number of people for pain and ICU and cardiac. They said, I don't want to make a commitment until I visit campus. And that has told us whether to make a commitment or not. A day on campus for the finalists. Yeah, yeah, great point. Thanks. One I, more? I, yep. uh, if it's very quick. Yep. Yes. Uh, yes, no answer almost. No. So for the complex exam, are two and three going to go past fail or are they already? Good. At this point, we're continuing to study that. You know, it was a pretty big change to, to do it with level one. The other two, our level two CE and our level three, do give both pass fail and the three digit numerical score. So we're studying that uh, very carefully. Right now, still provides the numerical score. And with that, I think that will be the last word on it. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Safe travels, everyone.